For the first time in five years, Oregon's defense might be better than its offense. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why, if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Make every moment more, not less, as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to, but... This summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Talk about Luke Moga's future, because I think he's a really interesting player as Oregon goes forward in the next couple of seasons. And um, yeah, this EA Sports College football video game that hasn't come out yet really likes Oregon. It's kind of a strange feeling. I kind of think they're right. But let's start with offense versus defense. Which unit? Ask yourself that question. If you're an everydayer or a big Oregon fan out there, which unit do you feel better about? All the preseason metrics would tell you that Oregon's offense is going to be better than its defense. I don't think that's necessarily the case. It could be. I'm not ruling it out. But if I'm looking at how many all-conference players are on either side of the ball, I feel like that's a healthy metric to determine which side is better. Who has more high-end all-conference caliber talent? And I think offensively, you have a handful of guys. I think both tackles, Connerly and Cornelius can. I don't know if Harper would get that sort of designation. I think he's just a really, really solid starter. And there are some good offensive lines in the Big Ten, to be sure. Dylan Gabriel can be an all-conference guy. Jordan James or Noah Whittington. But are they going to have the statistical seasons they need to garner that sort of attention? I don't know, because it might be kind of a split backfield. Maybe Jay Harris works himself into the fold or Jay and Lamar. And T. Ferg, obviously, all-conference caliber guy. Evan Stewart, Tez Johnson. So it's a pretty pretty healthy consortium of uh, individuals that could garner all-conference recognition this year in the Big Ten. But then you go to the defensive side of the ball, I think that number is even higher. Because I look at the entire, the entire defensive line and say those are all all-conference caliber guys. Derek Harmon is an NFL dude. Jordan Birch was honorable mention last year, could be even better this season. Jamari Caldwell was all-conference at Houston. And then amidst a loaded, and I mean loaded, group of edge rushers, any one of them could garner all-conference honors this year. There is no position offensively for Oregon or position group where I feel you have four guys every starter there that could garner that that sort of recognition this year or capable of of doing so in the role they are going to have this season. For example, if you took out Evan Stewart and Treshawn Holden was the number one, could be an all-conference guy. Is he going to get those opportunities as number three receiver? No, but that's okay. And the receiver room, crazy talented. So I, I think that's uh, the first part of it, the defensive line. Then, then you go to the next level and you say, well, We don't really know what Justin Jacobs can be healthy for a full season because we haven't seen it yet. You know, didn't see it at Iowa, didn't see it last year with Oregon. Got immense potential, was a highly touted recruit with good reason, but we don't really know. But if Jeffrey Bossa has uh, talked about him on a a recent episode of the show for an entire segment, if he has the season he's capable of, he could work himself into an earlier round NFL draft pick than Noah Sewell was and be one of the best linebackers in the Big Ten. Jabbar Muhammad, who, who is doubting that that guy has got all-conference potential. Kobe Savage was all-conference, second team in the Big 12 a season ago with Kansas State. Brandon Johnson, who I think is Oregon's starting nickel, has been honorable mention the last two years whilst playing at Duke, could be in line for his best season yet as, as he has another year you know, under his belt. Just a really experienced, solid, productive guy. And then you go around to the other cornerback position. I think that's probably Jaleel Florence. And I think that that's somebody who I've been high on since he got recruited to Oregon, played as a true freshman, was Oregon's number two corner last year. If he stays healthy this season, I don't know that he'd be in store for a big statistical year, but I think he's a tremendously well-rounded guy. And I I compared Brandon Finney, Oregon's latest cornerback recruit or first cornerback uh, recruit in the class of 2025 to Jaleel Florence because I think they're both very fluid athletes. They've got the build for it. 
and they just kind of have really, really good instincts at that position. So you go around the defense and you say, I, I think you've got one, at least one, maybe even multiple all-conference players in every single position group. And I don't know that you can say that with the same level of volume and depth as you can offensively. Now, the S&P metrics, FPI, whatever you want to look at, EA Sports College football ratings, we'll talk about that later. They all like Oregon's offense more than the defense. And that's understandable. Last year, the offense was certainly the better of the two sides of the ball. And I think 2019 was the last time where we could definitively say, yeah, Oregon is being carried by its defense here. And this is the other point of, uh, of my argument as to how I see this potentially, dare I say, probably playing out this year. Do you think Oregon's offense or defense is going to win them more games this season? That depends on what you mean by win them the game. I think this year you are going to have more games in which it feels like Oregon's defense is carrying the day than you did last year. Not because Oregon's offense won't be very good, because you're in a conference that has better defenses. So I expect the offense to take a step back production wise from what it was a season ago and still be one of the 10 best in all of college football. They're going up against tougher defenses who like to run the ball a little bit more as programs and kill the clock and not give you as many chances to put up a bunch of points. And that's going to call upon the defense to make stops, to make plays. Because if you think about Oregon's games last year, you know, most of the time, yeah, the defense was really good early in a lot of games or, you know, they took a little while to settle in and then the offense just pulled away because they couldn't get stopped. I think you're going to have more games this season that play out in a style that looks like no, oh, what's a good individual game? I should have thought of one before I came on here to record. But a game that that stylistically, Utah 2022. Yeah, 2022 Utah. Bo Nix is hobbled. Defense won them the game. Offense with Bo Nix, all things considered, did pretty well. They were facing one of the best defenses in the Pac-12. Offense did enough, but the defense made the plays. I think you'll have, at the very least, more games than a season ago where the defense kind of makes the plays or puts their foot down and, and really kind of establishes dominance in a given game to say, yeah, th this comeback or any potential hope you have of winning this football game is just not going to happen. So that's that, that I, I think both sides of the ball are really, really good. I think Oregon is a tremendously balanced team. And I, I think Ohio State is a really balanced team, but is in kind of the same boat where they have got a lot of high-end players, high-end NFL and all-conference caliber talent in the Big Ten this year on the defensive side of the ball, which is why, you know, earlier, I think it was this week, I, I mentioned that I think that game is going to have both teams scoring under 30, whereas last year, both big matchups with Washington, both teams were over 30. I think you're going to see both teams scoring uh, in the 20s when, when these teams meet on October 12th. Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter. Luke Moga is one of the best athletes on Oregon's roster. Not an exaggeration. So what does that actually mean for his playing career? We'll talk about that next. After we talk about eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. They've got superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors, they've got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. If you want to get into the mailbag, it's really easy. YouTube comments, X formerly known as Twitter, at S McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. Those are uh, the handles. If you want priority access and all sorts of other perks, go join the flock over at Subtext, that link in the description below, wherever you listen to or watch this show. This question came in from Thalek, T-H-A-L-E-C-K. All right, way off topic. Not at all, not way off topic. Maybe slightly, but not way off topic. Can Luke Moga catch? How is he at making people miss tackles? I'd like to get him on the field. I think Moga's career 
is is really really intriguing because this is a guy whose physical traits are at the highest level and we knew that coming out of high school he has ridiculously fast 100 meter dash time and a lot of his highlight plays when you watch his huddle film are him making plays on the ground he's just faster than a lot of guys and normally normally you make the jump to college and well he just you can't just outrun people you know i mean this is a jump there's an adjustment period yet yeah, not really the case with him i randomly think all the time about that play in the spring game he hands the ball off to one of the backup running backs who runs right hits a wall not tackled cuts it back takes off down the field for a touchdown the camera's panning on him and he breaks into the clear there he goes and then here comes Luke Moga just sprinting from behind. And he catches the running back by the time he gets into the end zone. And if that is it, now granted, is that Oregon's number one running back, Jordan James? Or is it Noah Whittington? No. It's still a guy who's playing college football, even if it's you know a, a walk-on or a guy who's never going to have a meaningful carry this year. Like, bet you if you saw him run in person, you'd still be pretty impressed. Moga is, is a freakishly good athlete. He's got some uh, a size to him a, as well. And look, I I certainly am not by any stretch of the imagination, want to make this very, very clear. I am not saying he has no prospects at quarterback for Oregon because 2026, I think is a year where he and maybe Achilles Smith Jr. are battling for the starting quarterback position. I think that's entirely possible. Moga is a true freshman this year. Next year, Achilles Smith will be a true freshman. Moga probably redshirts this season. And then after Achilles true freshman year, he probably red shirts, and Dante Moore starts in 2025, or Austin Novosad, whoever wins that quarterback battle, the other one probably transfers out, and then in 2026, if they feel good about those two dudes, they'll both have at least one, or in Moga's case, two years of being in Oregon's system, I don't know if Will Stein will still be around as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, by 2026, I'd imagine not, but that's Moga's timeline for starting as Oregon's quarterback. I don't see him as someone because coming out of high school, you know, uh, not not the most highly rated guy, not because he lacks the physical traits, like he, he's got a good arm, he can he can push the ball down the field, he's incredibly fast, he's incredibly athletic, he's not remarkably refined as a passer compared to other guys, it's why Achilles is higher rated than him coming out or Dante Moore, it, it's about, you know, the, the little stuff, playing quarterback, and we saw with Ty Thompson, the little stuff matters a whole heck of a lot. So I think that for for Moga, 25 is not a year where I expect him to compete. And look, it, maybe he thinks that that's where he, he's going to make more of an, of, of an impact than people think. And I'll get to his 2025 season in just a sec. But I think 26 is the year where he, he will have an opportunity to start. No guarantee that he does. It'll be about his development, how good Achilles Smith Jr. is when he gets to campus and learning the system and picking up the college game and everything like that. But Moga, I don't think has a role this year. I wouldn't rule it out. In 2025, though, after he's been around a college football program for a year, been in the weight room for for a year as well, and and gotten acclimated to you know everything that Oregon does offensively, would not be shocked because Dante Moore isn't a runner. If Luke Moga had some sort of wildcat package in 2025, could totally see it. Think Brian Bennett. Colt Lyurla in 2012. Bennett was, you know, fine as a passer. Frankly, now that I think about it, Brian Bennett, not a bad comp for Luke Moga at all. And Bennett might have been, by by the time he left Oregon, a little bit more refined as a passer. Forever the best backup quarterback, Brian Bennett. Moga is someone who could absolutely come in in some kind of, you know, run situation or short yardage and all this sort of stuff. Like you've seen teams like like Washington, for instance, for a long time has run the Wildcat a lot. And there are plenty of teams that do that with a backup quarterback. And Moga has all the athleticism and all the traits to excel in that sort of, of environment. And then if you could at least present the threat of throwing the football, you can open up that Wildcat short yardage playbook of sorts. Because being able to run the quarterback, even if the defense might know it's coming in the red zone in particular, you know, Steve Sarkeesian's had a lot of uh, success with with those sorts of plays over the years. Um, I mean, Sam Ellinger was I think, before uh, Sark actually got there, but 
I, I think of those sort. I, I thought Texas always ran those plays really, really well in the red zone. Oklahoma last year with our, our now quarterback Dylan Gabriel, they had a lot of success running the quarterback down there. It just opens up a, a lot of a, a lot of things for your defense. That's not necessarily Dante Moore's game. So you know, Darren Thomas was. Well, Mar- Mariota was actually the quarterback in 2012. We know that he was able to run a- exceptionally well. I thought in 2011 they could have had a package for for Brian Bennett to to come in. I they might have had it, and I'm just misremembering. I remember specifically they had it in 2012 because that was the year they played Arizona at home, and Lyola dragged Bennett across the end zone because he wanted the ball, but Bennett was going to pull it, and they just kind of you know forced their way across the goal line there. I think Moga's athleticism is just so so substantial that if you feel like that's advantageous yeah i'd I'd be all on board for and then you get him live game action as well you know you look at uh, an alex orgy situation this past year over uh, at michigan for instance he might be might not be but he might be their starting quarterback this year he was a wildcat guy a year ago a team won a national championship like it sounds like a gimmick to try to prevent a guy from transferring and get him on the field and such it can clearly be used by high-level programs in, in advantageous situations. So I could see that. Now, to your question, can he catch? Could he end up playing receiver one day? Sure. Sure. One one thousand percent possible. Quarterbacks have switched to play receiver before. Braxton Miller comes to mind. Another good comp for Luke Moga. Really, really good athlete. What can he be as a passer? You know, Miller was good, and then they had JT Barrett in there, and they moved Braxton Miller out to wide receiver, and Braxton Miller ended up getting drafted into the NFL and played for several years at, at wide. He might still be bouncing around somewhere in a practice squad for, for all I know. I can't say I've kept tabs on him recently, but you know, if Moga doesn't see a path at the quarterback position, but wants to stay at Oregon. Yeah. You could consider a, rece- a, a switch to receiver. The problem with that, as I've talked about for, you know, the last several months here on the show, man, Oregon's recruiting receivers like they never have before. And the receiving core is just going to be a really, really tough group to crack for someone that'd be learning the position by 25 or 26. I mean, Gatlin Bear shows up ahead of the 2026 season. Next year, you're looking at a receiving core of, you know, probably Jurion Dickey, Jeremiah McClellan, Ryan Pelham, maybe, you know, another guy in that class, like a Jack Wrestler or a Dylan Gresham, somebody like that got a lot of big time blue chip wide out prospects that that are ready to take the reins after this year's core for the most part moves on Gary Bryant Jr. could come back uh, I believe for one more season because he had a COVID and a red shirt over at USC but that that's you know unclear right now you could have four new top line receivers for Oregon next year which is crazy to think about but yeah good question see not off topic at all whatsoever great time of year to be thinking about what the future holds and I think for Luke Moga, he could be a starting quarterback. If you told me right now he plays for Oregon, never starts a game, yeah, I can see that too. Turns out other guys are also very talented. But in 2025, I'd be down for a wildcat package, 100%. I'm also down for EA Sports college football because it's less than a month away. Boy, they love Oregon a lot. Are they crazy? We'll talk about that next. First, we're talking about FanDuel because they're bringing this episode to you. I love sports, all sports, well, most sports, I should say, and I love them so much I never want them to stop, but as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't sporting like I want them to, but FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood, and that includes, but is not limited to, Anything you can want pertaining to Oregon. Win total, Ohio State game, national title odds, conference title odds. It's all over there. And this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. So last mailbag here to end today's show and is about a topic I am 100% here for and a thousand percent excited for. I would love to even play against some of you one day. If you're interested, just shoot me a DM. And once the game is out and I'm able to play, let's play some college football because I'm stoked. This from Moody Man. I see that EA college football video game dropped defense and offensive rankings this morning. 
Some of them were a little questionable. Not not that surprised to see Oregon ranked at the top for offense, although being tied with Georgia for the highest rated offense in the game may take some getting used to seeing. But the Ducks defense is ranked a 90 overall, which makes them the third highest ranked defense in the game. Does the defensive ranking surprise you more than offense? No, it does not. As I discussed earlier in the show, you have got such a depth of talent at key positions all over that defense. I think it can be the best defense Oregon has had since 2019, a year in which they averaged uh, fewer than 20 points per game allowed. And they did that a season ago. It's easy to forget that, but that's a thing that happened. And they were doing that in a much tougher offensive conference. Last year, Oregon allowed 17, 17 and a half points per game. That number could be down below 15 this year. I fully believe that. You are not going up against the lineup of quarterbacks or offensively minded head coaches or just offenses in general that can put up numbers like a season ago. So when I saw those rankings come out, like some of them were curious. You know, Michigan was seventh in defense. That's, I don't know know about that. Um, That like, that might be a touch low. You could have Michigan not number one. I don't know if you can have them outside the top five, but you know, EA has has their own their own metrics for how they they're they're deciding all of these things. But seeing Oregon, you know, amongst the best teams in college football, it's just another reminder that guess what? This Oregon team is really good, and they have, I believe, the best preseason national championship odds since 2014 when they went to the national championship game. I think you have the best defensive line since that year. I think you have the most hype since that season. And the schedule just shape, shapes up in a way that national championship discussion is completely warranted with Oregon. Completely warranted. And the playoff is a borderline expectation. And when you are in that sort of realm, when you've acquired talent the way that Dan Lanning and company have, this is what you're going to see. And yeah, it is a little strange to look at Georgia and say, should Oregon really be there? Because last time Georgia played Oregon, it didn't go very well. What you have to remember is that 2022 team compared to this one? This one is just much better. It just is. Now, you could look at these rankings and say, ah, they're a little inflated. You know, should they really be that high up? There should be top three to four in, in both nationally. Maybe that's being a tad generous. I don't know how those rankings necessarily get created or whether they're, you know, using all the, the right philosophies and data and all that sort of stuff. But having Oregon inside the top 10 for both, yeah, I I fully expect that to be the case this year. Having a top 10 offense and a top 10 defense in the same season, not something just in terms of points and or yards per game allowed, not something that you see a lot of teams in college football accomplishing. I think Oregon can absolutely get there. And as I talked about earlier on the show, I think the defense has got a chance to put up even better numbers than the offense. It's hard to compare those things because... You're talking about points allowed versus points scored, yards allowed, yards gain. You know, they're not a one to one comparison. Like, there isn't a, you know, yo yo string you can tie where, like, hey, if, you know, the equivalent of gaining 400, at least not that I'm aware of, maybe there's an analytic number about about this somewhere. The equivalent of gaining 450 yards is like allowing 275 yards or or, or something like that. I, I don't know what that metric is. Maybe it exists. Uh, somewhere in the world out there. There are a lot of numbers nowadays, so so perhaps. But no, I, I was not surprised to see Oregon up there because that's where my expectation is. That that That's where I put this Oregon team is one of the five best in college football on paper going into the season. You got to get out there and execute because games aren't played on paper. They're played on the field. But right now, it, it feels like Oregon has a better chance to go 12-0 and than they do 9-3. and the schedule works out incredibly well. You combine that. If the schedule was different, I don't think I'd feel that way, but it does, so I do. You combine that with a roster that has acquired high-end talent, that has got a bunch of key returners, that has replaced key losses with high-end talent. Like You think about going from Kyrie Jackson. I mean, Oregon's number one corners each of the last few years have just been stellar. You go from Christian Gonzalez, who's probably the best of the three, to Kyrie Jackson, who's an all-conference selection, to Jabbar Muhammad, who's going to be an early-round NFL draft pick, you know, probably second, third, fourth round, somewhere in that range. I don't know that he's got a first-round grade. 
that's pretty remarkable run of having your top outside corner or boundary corner be that that sort of guy. That that's not an easy thing to do. But Oregon's competing in in, in the transfer portal classes for for these sorts of guys, and then they're landing them. They're not just in the running; they're getting these sorts of guys. So. Yeah, I, I think they deserve to be in that sort of discussion. And I think it's an exciting time to be an Oregon fan. And I can't wait for the season to start. Next time I talk to you all, it will be the month of July. I'll see you then. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And go Ducks.